Hey everyone, welcome and thank you for joining us today. We're trying something a little bit different. If you didn't notice, since now you're actually seeing us on, on the screen here on YouTube. But today we wanted to address those that are considering making the jump to electrical estimating, or maybe you're a business owner and you're considering hiring internally or uh, promoting and training someone to become an electrical estimator. So today's presentation will cover the six things that we think are important for you to consider, and probably more things. Uh, we're trying this YouTube Live platform today because we've been adding a lot of videos to our YouTube channel and have gotten thousands of, of views and a lot of feedback about them, very positive feedback. So we thought, let's go all in and do a live. Why not? That's what the cool kids are doing, right? And uh, I wanted to mention that on the right side of the screen is a chat. So you can chat there or you can ask questions there, but we ask that you use the Google form that we have linked to in the description under the video. If you click that, it'll bring up a basic Google form and you can type in a question and we'll address that at some point during this live. So I wanted to introduce myself. I'm Derek Delacuadri. I'm the president of Vision InfoSoft and Brian Hoffelder joins us today. And he's the one in the lower screen. He's uh, um, he, he's sharing that the, the presentation in the upper left. And Brian is Vision's training and software development expert, and he'll be handling the presentation today and answering your questions. So, Brian? All right. Thanks, Derek. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our, our presentation here. You know, I think the impetus for this presentation was the, the fact that, that my experience includes working with not only thousands of estimators over the years, but every level of experience. So I've not only had the opportunity to, to train people in how to use software for estimating and actually even train people who've never done estimating to use an estimating program and to do estimating, but more importantly, I've had the opportunity to learn from them. So I've seen every aspect of estimating, every trait, uh, every everything on the spectrum from beginners to very, very experienced people with 20, 30, even more 40 plus years, uh, people working on little projects, big projects and everything in between. So I think that experience gives me a, a unique perspective on what's important in being an electrical estimator. So one of the things, let's see if I can get my slideshow to move there. There we go. Is electrical construction knowledge. At some point you need a fundamental understanding of electrical construction. Uh, not just the the understanding of how things get installed in the field, although we'll talk about that too, but just a basic fundamental understanding of electrical construction, how things are put together, what all the main components do, and just a fundamental working knowledge of the of the electrical construction trade. Now that's a little bit different again than field experience. Um, some of that stuff you can learn from books, some of it you can learn from being in the field, but you just have to to eventually get to the point where you get a, a basic understanding of how uh, electrical construction works. Another important aspect of being an electrical estimator is the analytical skills, which kind of goes hand in hand with computer skills. Now, you don't have to be a programmer by any means. You don't even have to be a whiz bang computer person, but you have to understand how to use computers. And a part of that is your analytical school skills. You know, if you're somebody that takes a long time to, to look at a blueprint and digest things, then, you know, in the long run, you're, you're going to be uh, struggling with estimating. You've got to be fairly quick and you've got to be fairly uh, capable of, of analyzing, you know, electrical projects so that you understand them enough to do the electrical estimate. One of the big questions I've get many times over the years is, does it require field experience to be an electrical estimator? And I, I guess I can answer that kind of ambiguously, yes and no. Uh, it certainly helps to have the field experience because the really important thing is you can get, as an estimator, you get to the point where you can visualize things. You've got to be able to look at the blueprint and visualize what the electrical items are that need to be installed. Now, you don't have to be skilled at bending pipe. Um, that certainly would not be me, but I've been out in the field enough working with uh, electricians and 
and actually on job sites to to know what it is that's required to do the various parts of the installation. So actually doing the installation helps a lot, but I've also seen people who've had little or no field experience get to the point where they can visualize things and they're very capable of being a, a, a very qualified electrical estimator. This is a big one for me because I see all ranges in the spectrum here as far as people who are very detailed oriented, very accurate versus people who are maybe less detailed, but they're more efficient. You know, where's the trade-off there? You know, it's, it's ideally somewhere in between. And again, I've worked with estimators that are so detailed to the point where it, it almost drives you crazy. But the problem there is they can, you know, it's sometimes they just can't even get through the estimate because they're, they're so caught up in the detail. They don't see the forest for the trees. I know that's kind of a funny old expression, but you really need to be somewhere in the middle. Um, uh, again, I've seen people who are so uh, un, undetail oriented, I guess is the way to put it, that they miss things, and that's not good either. But you can't get too caught up in the detail where you can't get the job done. So there's a, there's a really important balance there. It's, you know, it's something that you really need to kind of always be questioning as an estimator. Am I being too detail oriented am I, or am I being too too sloppy, too inaccurate? One thing that's real important is blueprint reading. Again, this kind of some of these some of these skills overlap each other, but a person that's very capable of reading an electrical blueprint because their their analytical skills are good. They they can they can digest the the blueprint very quickly. Again, I've worked with estimators who can look at a page that's got hundreds of items on it and just quickly grasp what it's about. Other people need to struggle with it for long periods of time, and, and uh, that's not good either. But you need to be able to read electrical blueprints. You need to be able to visualize from the blueprints what is going to be required to install the materials. So being able to read electrical blueprints is important. Again, I've, I've tried to train people who have no electrical blueprint reading background, and it's almost impossible. To, to train them to do to be an electrical estimator or to use an electrical estimating program if they if they can't read the electrical blueprints. So again, a, a good est electrical estimator would look at this page here that you see and they'd instantly know what what they're looking at. They don't even need to look at the symbol schedule. Most of that stuff is fairly standard, fairly straightforward. And finally, one of the things I've run across many times over the years um, is requiring or looking at the multitasking aspect of possibly being a project manager and an estimator. Now, I know some companies, they separate the duties totally. The project managers project manage and the estimators estimate and they try not to cross over. Now, in reality, probably that's not usually the case. It's usually kind of a hybrid. So you've got to be capable of, of multitasking. You know, you're going to have people interrupting you if you're doing an estimate to, to, with the questions about the job they're running or about the job you're running. So it may require some multitasking uh, skills that some people aren't comfortable with, some people aren't good at. Uh, so that's something to know when you, when you go into electrical estimating, if you're thinking about going into it, or if you're thinking about hiring somebody to be an electrical estimator, is how much are you going to ask them to multitask? And... You know, are they going to be good at that? Some people just can't multitask. Other people do it too often to the point where they, they don't focus well. So a lot of these skills as electrical estimator are a balance. And that's, that's again, one of the things I've been had the opportunity to see over the years with all the estimators I've trained is, you know, where that balance uh, works the best. And it also may vary with the company you're working for, the kind of jobs you're doing. You know, if you're doing very high-tech jobs, then you have to be a little more detail-oriented. Uh, if you're doing kind of uh, general electrical commercial construction, uh, you maybe get away with a little less attention to detail because things are fairly standard and, and routine. So I think that's about all I have, Derek. Um, did you have any questions or input yeah. from anybody? You know, the multitasking one is uh, is an important one. I know I get caught with that one sometimes, trying to do too much. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, um, yeah, I, I just have two questions right now. 
the first one is how much field experience do I need? And again, that's kind of a dependent on the person. Um, it always helps to have field experience to at least to, to begin with. But also I found some of the, sometimes the best estimators are, are sometimes the thing that doesn't make people a person a good estimator is if they've had so much field experience, they can't step back from it and and see the, the general part of the job. So it's certainly good to have some field experience to get to that point where you can visualize things, but you can get that just by going on the job sites, having people uh, explain things to you. Have, even you know these days when you Google things, you can get bit, you can get visual images of what things look like. So I wouldn't say field experience is becoming less important, but it's a little more easy to attain. Uh, I hope that answers the question. I know it's a little bit of an ambiguous answer. Yeah, it probably depends on the type of jobs that are being bid on that that, that company specializes in. Mm -hmm. um, and the second one was, how much does an electrical estimator make? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Of course, it's going to, again, depend on experience. Typically, uh, you know, an experienced estimator will probably start somewhere at the, uh, at whatever the journeyman level is in that area and, and on up from there. And again, it would depend on the size of the projects, the size of the company. If you're managing a, a staff of 10 estimators, that's going to be, you know, more, it's going to, provide more uh, uh, compensation than somebody who's the only estimator or one or two estimators in a company, but kind of starting from a journeyman level and on up again, depending on the other factors that are involved. Right. Right. All right. Well, right now I don't have any further questions. Um, what should we do? Should we skip on to the next slide, I suppose. Uh, if, if you do have any questions, feel free to click the link on that Google form in the chat or below the, the, the this video, or just chat it if you want. All right, so, okay, the slide you brought up was just our YouTube channel. Just wanted to mention again, uh, there's a subscribe button on our YouTube channel, and if you click that while logged in, of course, you can um, get alerts via email whenever we post a new video or or um, other content like this. We'll probably do more lives going forward and we'll just keep experimenting to see what works best for us. And let's see. Yeah, so subscribe to that. In fact, I didn't mention earlier, but the you, you actually can't chat unless you're logged in to YouTube um, for these lives, which... It's kind of funny, but I get it. They need to know who you are. That's why we have the Google form to ask questions. And here's just some kind of some final information. If you have any questions for us, um, here's our phone number and our email address and website. And before, well, actually, we have a question, but um, you want to address that, Brian? Yeah, I see that. And then that's, again, going to vary with the situation. What is a typical time frame for a bid? It'll depend on... A, you know, it should depend a lot on the size of the job. Obviously, it's going to take you a lot less time to take off a job that's one or two pages versus 20 or 30 pages. Um, but that's a really important thing that an estimator needs to look at when they get a project. You know, how much time can they devote to it? How much time is it going to take to do the estimate? Now, it takes some experience to know that. You know, you, you probably won't know when the first couple dozen estimates you do how long they're going to take. It takes some, it takes some practice. But it's a really good uh a good skill to be able to, it's important to be able to organize your time, uh, be able to work enough without interruptions that you can get the bid out on time if it's a tight time frame. So I think it's one of the things estimators sometimes aren't very good at is planning their time, being realistic about how long it's going to take them to do the bid. Um, what, what's that? Isn't there a joke answer for this question? Something about the, the weight of the electrical. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's how you come up with a bid. You weigh the drawings and that's. Weigh the drawings. And then it doesn't take very long at all. Nope. You have to find your scale under all of the. A real the general, general rule of thumb I use just, again, again, this works for me. Is it, you know, it, I think it averages about an hour per page. And that's probably on the high side. But again, there'll be some pages where there's very little information that you need to 
to do besides review it for the estimate. And there may be other pages where you've got, you know, hundreds of things to count and measure and, and take off. So it will vary, but if, you know, if I had to take a rough estimate and I had a 10 page set of electrical prints, I would allow up to 10 hours to do the bid. And that's, again, that's probably on the high side with experience and practice, you should get that down um, maybe half of that. And of course, an estimating program will help you cut that way down. But the takeoff time, whether you're doing it electronically, whether you're doing it manually, whether you're doing it with a, a spreadsheet, you know, it takes time to count and measure from the drawings. And, you know, to be accurate, you've got to make sure that you count everything and, and measure all of the appropriate uh, parts of the wiring. All right. I have a few more questions coming in now. You want to answer uh, Pulsar's question? Is it wrong sure. to only bid labor? It, it definitely isn't, but it's something to be very uh, aware of if you're, if you're only asked, being asked to bid the labor. Obviously, you need to mark up more than you would... Uh, the entire project more than if it was a combination of material and labor mm -hmm. because usually there's a pretty equal balance between material costs and labor costs and so if you're at adding 10 percent or 30 percent to a to a job and now you're only doing half of the job then you need to definitely increase your markup the other thing is that the labor is a much riskier part of the job you know it's much more difficult to control the performance and the productivity of the labor than it is to just simply buy the materials you know, uh, purchasing materials is a much more uh, straightforward part of the job than, than managing the labor. So that's a, a good question. Yeah, I think we did a video on that, didn't we? Yeah. Just recently, the five best yeah. markup strategies. Yep, yeah, that was part of what we covered, yep. And I just uh, responded to you, Pulsar, with a link to that video if it helps. All right, I'm gonna, um, let, let's get to, to William's question in just a second. I have a couple that came in earlier. <laughs> Victor asks, where do I sign up? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure what he means exactly, but on the, on the slide there, you, could, you can contact us and we could help you sign up. <laughs> um, uh, so I see the question about material escalation. What is a good percentage factor? I guess the, the implication there is that material is now a bigger part of the job than it used to be you know although labor costs have also escalated probably not as drastically as material costs and again they used to say the old ratio the, the rule of thumb was 50 50. Um, and you know from my experience which is mostly in the commercial world that's probably pretty typical so so maybe that ratio is a little bit higher now on the material side um, but i haven't really looked at that part of the of the material escalation uh, part of it. So it might be instead of 50-50, now it's 60-40 or something like that as far as the material. Let's see. All right, so I have, um, are there any associations for individuals interested in electrical estimating? Ah, yeah, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there's really, two, three trade associations for the electrical business. There's a NECA, the National Electrical Contractors Association. That's the, the union uh, part of the industry. There's IEC, which is Independent Electrical Contractors. Uh, those are all independent, non-union contractors. And there's also ABC, probably the, the least common of the three. But ABC has uh, multiple trade chapters in there, but they're typically their largest group if there is one in your area will be the electrical group so that's where the electricians go for training learning the code uh, that kind of thing and some of those associations have estimating training which is i think was the direction of the question um, we offer i offer a class in estimating fundamentals that's a full day class we've done it in, oh maybe a half a dozen different places in the in the country um, I've also gone, I've also worked with estimators one-on-one -on -one to, to teach them estimating. Um, so I would check with your local trade association first to see if they have anything. It, it isn't easy to find, you know, estimating, training an estimator is not a real common thing. So um, if you need some help, that's something we can probably help you with, you know, 
Sometimes people need a couple hours. Sometimes they need a few days. Uh, it'll depend on your skills and your background. And, and honestly, one of the things that really helps an estimator to learn how to estimate is is a good electrical estimating program because it asks you the things. You know, how many feet of this particular combina- uh, wiring assembly do you need? How many receptacles do you need? You know, and what specifications? It'll it'll ask you all those things that you need to know to to input the input the takeoff from the estimate. So I, I think actually learning a, an estimating electrical estimating program is a good part of the training process. Certainly and helped me a long way. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> electrical bid manager. Uh, I, I also posted to the chat the ASPE National, the American Society of Professional Estimators. Uh-huh. I mean it's it's more general, but they cover all the trades and you know they have events and there's a big electrical presence there within. Yep, there group. is a big electrical presence, and those probably tend to be the the higher visibility type uh, estimators who work in you know on the high visibility type projects. You know, said, that's a fairly mm-hmm. um, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, established. You know, it's, yeah, it's it's not probably where a beginner would go. Right, maybe but, not. You know, they certainly would be able to, to direct you to get experience though. So I think actually to join that association, you probably have to meet some minimum requirements. Yeah. Well, you know what? There's a student um, membership that's $30 oh, okay. a year and need be, it says shall be a full-time student actively pursuing a curriculum leading to a degree or certificate in a construction related field at a college or university. So I don't know. That's, and there are a few colleges, actually, traditional four-year colleges that offer uh, electrical estimating. Yes, you know, you can get a, mm-hmm. a degree in electrical estimating. I know Arizona State has a program. I think Purdue has one. Um, and I'm sure there's a few others. But, you know, they actually have a four-year traditional college program that gets you a, a degree with a emphasis in electrical construction. Yeah. We should create a list of that at some point and share it um i did have another i wanted to give a shout out to candels um yes I meant they to offer a fair uh, a thorough um on demand um electrical estimating certification academy and i'll chat that link to them if you want to take a look at it In and fact, that's we should a, be, go ahead probably comparable to like a you know a, a, a university at least a semester or two class you would take in a university. It's, it's a very, you know, it's a, it's a pretty extensive program. Um, our, our program is more of a one day introduce you to the concepts and get to the basics down where Candell's is a, is a much longer process of going through things. Right. Right. And I think they are joining us next month or April for a, a joint webinar or live. We haven't decided that yet. What we're, what platform. All right. Uh, I had one more question that came in from the Google form, and then there's one more in chat. All right. How much, how much material markup can we use to be competitive? I'm sure it depends on the field, industrial, commercial, residential. Is it just trial and error to find the sweet spot? Yeah, that's not an easy question. You know, it is to a certain extent trial and error. Um, you know, until you bid enough jobs where you're not being successful, you know, probably you're putting too much markup and vice versa. If you're getting everything you bid, that's probably not good either. Um, so it's really important to monitor it. You know, I think sometimes estimators get in the habit of I finished the job, I, I, I got it or didn't get it, and that's, that's the end. Um, you really need to get feedback if whoever you're bidding the job doesn't give you feedback on where your bid, how close you were to the low bid. If you weren't the low bidder, then you know you really don't want to waste your time with with whoever that customer was. Um, I think you know the national average they say for marking for markup for is somewhere in the 18% range. You know, that's for overhead and profit, and how you split it up is is not as critical, but that's what they say the average is. If you're not marking up your jobs somewhere in that range, you might be going too low. But again, it depends on the kind of work you're doing. If you're doing really big jobs, that number probably goes down. If 
you do a really easy job, that number goes down and vice versa. If it's a very difficult job and it's a very small job, you don't want to be doing, uh, doing it without making some money. So it's trial and error to that, to that extent, but it's also uh, analytical to the extent that you can look at each job and, and see maybe where you need to adjust your markup up or down. All right. So there was an earlier question. What is the best labor unit manual for residential? Ah, for residential, I'm not aware of too many. There used to be one. I can't think of it off the top of my head. Um, yeah, I don't. For residential, I don't know. For for commercial, there's the NECA labor manual. It, it does cover some residential items. NECA, uh, the NECA labor manual was a very comprehensive labor manual. And then there's also uh, RS Means. RS Means has, has different books, different versions for different trades. Um, and you know, even residential, there's quite a spectrum. There's the very simple uh, tract homes where they're, they're all the same, or there's two or three plants in the same development all the way up to multifamily units, apartments with hundreds of uh, units in a, in a big project. So that's, that's a whole different world than the electrician who's doing one project at a time. And then, then there's custom homes. That, that again is its own little unique part of the residential market. So it, it's quite a spectrum. Um, most of my experiences with the, the guys who are either doing custom homes or with the ones who are doing the larger multi-family, multi-unit residential. Both of those kind of projects tend to be a lot like commercial. See, I think there was another question from Keith. How would you recommend, what would you recommend for updating material increases Applying to a final bid, expecting a large bid that could take longer than average estimate. I'm not sure I totally understand that question, but I think maybe the issue is, should you be putting an allowance into your final bid to allow for escalation of prices? I, you know, I, I think to some extent we've seen some leveling of off of material prices, but you know, now with you know some of the things that are happening in the world these days, we may can, we may see more inflation. Uh, over the last year and a half, you know, the commodities were just crazy increases. Really important to to qualify that your bid is good for no more than 30 days. And I wouldn't be, you know, I wouldn't be ashamed to, you know, submit a bid that's only good for a week or two weeks. Um, you can't be expected to take on that risk. And I don't think the, the, the customer should be expecting you to take on that risk either. So it's really important to qualify the bid. Maybe give yourself a little bit of an allowance in your pricing, you know, but um, if there's something that dramatic happens, your proposal and your, even your contract should give you some recourse if prices escalate too, too, too much. Yeah, I know we've been asked that one. Yep. Before. And now with the, the Russia, Ukraine, situation It'd be interesting to watch how that affects us yep all right i have a question that came in from the google form uh, i'm not sure if i could put this on screen it's kind of longer but I, see i send a follow-up email two weeks you know what i'm gonna i'm just gonna try because i want you to see it okay hopefully it comes out if it doesn't it doesn't there it is. Yep. Right. So this is Erica, and she had some formatting. Like, So hopefully this is still okay to follow. I think that's great. Yeah, I, I think that's great. So I'll just read it. Um, I sent a follow-up email two weeks after I sent out a bid that states... It is our normal procedure to follow up on proposals that have been sent out for review after two weeks if we haven't heard anything. I'd like to follow up with you on the proposal. 
Um, yeah, so that's I think she's addressing the the pricing issue, the material mm -hmm. escalation. So but she's also addressing the issue of getting feedback on your bids so that you know if you're being competitive or not. Right. You know, you don't want to just be cranking out bids for the sake of cranking out bids, and you also don't want to be cranking out bids just to help your competitors. You know. <laughs> uh, by giving them a, a, a target to shoot for. Mm. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Erica. When do you get your allowance from the bid? Not sure what that means. Um, I'm guessing, yeah, I'm guessing it means when you get like a first payment, like to... I'm I thought sure that either. was maybe referring to an allowance for price escalation. Um, um, so I'm not really sure how to answer that. Maybe you could try to qu clarify that, Maverick. All right. Yeah, so while he's doing that, I, that that's all the questions we have right now. If, if anyone else out there has any questions, we can... Um, We'll be here for another 10 minutes if, if there, there is, there are questions. Um, I think you already covered, Brian, your, your training, the training that we offer here at Vision and that you lead. I don't think we really did. Um, mm. you know, we, we do have, have several types of training. We do a lot of online training these days. Some of it's one-on-one. -on -one. <clears throat> we have a, a virtual classroom that we provide with three different classes where you're actually in with anywhere from two to six other companies and we're training you all simultaneously and the unique thing about that is unlike zoom which is only allows me to see one screen at a time with this program called cloud share i can see you know half a dozen or more monitors so i can effectively lead a class as opposed to just doing one-on-one -on -one. Um, i also do a, a fair amount of on-site training now so i'll go out to a company uh, and spend a, usually two days or so uh, either getting them up to speed, getting them started, fine tuning, or maybe a little bit of all that. Usually companies that have more than one estimator. Um, and then we also do in-person classes. We, we typically go to one area of the country every two or three months and we have introductory classes, advanced classes. And again, those are multiple companies at the same time. Um, yeah. yeah, one thing I wanted to mention, Brian, um, or have you discuss a little bit is kind of the spectrum of uh, skill levels, I suppose, and estimating experience that you're used to training, especially in our C1, our online course, that's sort of our getting started with our software course, our estimating software. Uh, I'm not sure how to answer what do I see, but I, I think it's important that you have some of those fundamental skills before you you start using an estimating program. You've got to have at least a, a little bit of uh, understanding of how to read blueprints. Mm -hmm. You have to have some fundamental knowledge of electrical work. I can't just take somebody who's uh, been Green. working at, yeah, and working at a clerical job or a, you know, um, a lot of other disciplines. They need to have some exposure to the electrical construction world before they can start to understand what is required to put together an electrical estimate. Right. Perfect. Okay. Well, Matter I think fact, that we're kind I, of. I had somebody last was it last week that <clears throat> came was doing an introductory training session, and I and I told her you need to have your boss there because it, you know, it was clear that she didn't have any understanding of electrical construction or blueprint reading or field experience and all that because if he's expecting you to input the takeoff into the program, he needs to know what you need. Uh, what information you need to input it because otherwise you you won't have any you know, it just won't work you, you, somebody has to understand the the fundamentals all right well thank you everyone for joining us today and it looks like we kind of are wrapping up with our questions and maverick you feel free to email us at sales at visioninfosoft.com and we can answer that question or you can visit our website and submit the question via contact us form uh, we, we do these webinars once a month right now, and we're considering doing lives kind of intermingled with our 
our official webinars that we do, but we might just start pushing this platform because we, we wanted to connect with you with video and this platform works really well for that just to make it more personal and, and uh, you know, connect with you better and allow more feedback and allow people to chat and just a better energy overall. So thank you, Brian, for leading us today and uh, we'll see everyone soon. All right. Thank you all.